Welcome everybody. And um, we're here for the live stream explaining how to create an embellished version of a blues melody. And so <clears throat> I'm going to keep this lesson fairly concise. If you've been following along with this week's lessons on Monday, I uh, did a lengthy lesson on improvisation on this tune, this eight bar blues. And then yesterday, spent some time talking about working on your groove, your right hand coordination, syncopation, and all of that. And if you missed those lessons, uh, you can still go watch them. They're posted on my site at fretboardconfidential.com forward slash improvisation. And I've also put a link in the chat, and I'll post a link um, beneath the lesson when I'm done streaming, um, if you want to get the tab for this lesson, or you, you can get the tab either <clears throat> from the link for this lesson, which is the same thing, only it's fretboardconfidential.com forward slash embellished. Uh, and you can go there, or you can just go to the lessons I just mentioned, and where it says download the PDF, there's a complete booklet for the whole lesson series for the week. And as kind of an appendix at the end, I've put the tab uh, the two pages of tab for the arrangement that uh, I'll be talking about today. So we're going to focus specifically on how to take a melody that you might play in the open position and move it up the neck. Some of the things you might need to do to make that sound more complete using double stops, using chord voicings, and then some of the ways that you can extend it and make it sound cool, like using chord substitutions and blues licks and syncopation. So, if everything's sounding okay and looking all right, uh, we'll get started. Oh, uh, and I'll try to keep an eye on the chat as we go. Um, I'm going to dive right in here. Um, but a quick question about what happened to yesterday's YouTube interview. Um, huh. I wasn't completely clear on where the links were, but if you just go on either YouTube or Facebook and you do a search for Jeff Plankenhorn's 20 Question Tuesdays, uh, you can find it. Um, and if you can't, I'll post some links uh, to the mailing list. Uh, if you're not getting uh, the news about my lessons or you want to get my weekly newsletter, you can just go to my website to fretboardconfidential.com and there's a link to sign up and subscribe and then you'll get all the notifications and all that kind of stuff. So let's get rolling. So um, what I like to, oh, the URL is misspelled. <laughs> Great. Well, I'll put it in one more time and hopefully we'll get it right. Let's try that. Okay. Um, yeah, so in this lesson, I'm just gonna focus on the melody to the tune. There's other lessons before and after this one this week that talk about the improvisation, about building out a more complete arrangement. Um, I'm actually gonna talk in depth about arranging tomorrow. But today we're just focused on taking a basic version of a tune and then playing that tune um, in a more elaborate kind of way because a lot of times what you want to be able to do is play the tune once and then the second time around you want to do something else with the tune so i picked something short so we could actually like spend some time seeing what to do with it and the tune itself has a pretty straightforward chord progression we just got two bars of e minor and then two uh, a bar of a going back to e Sometimes you can play A to A7 as kind of a chord substitution. And then back to E minor. You repeat the first section, the two bars of E minor, and then the turnaround is C7 to B7 to E minor. And over that, the basic melody is just gonna go like this. And then. And that repeats the first section. And there's a tab for that arrangement as well at the beginning of the PDF. So um, I'm using the steady bass style, just keeping quarter notes going with my thumb while my index, middle, and ring finger are doing uh, all the melody stuff. Now, one of the simplest things you can do to create a variation on the melody is take it up an octave. And so in that case, we'd be up here. 
And one way you can think about it is just to think in terms of the intervals, right? Here's the flat third and the fifth, and the scale is kind of built out of an E blues scale. So we go up here. And you can see that the whole melody is kind of sitting inside this E minor triad, inside this chord shape. And so just going up there for the first phrase, we can get the first part of our variation. One of the things about playing up here is that the higher up you get on the neck when you're playing the steady bass, the more of a gap there is, just kind of the mid-range is just kind of empty, right? You've just got the bass all the way down here and the melody way up here. It can feel kind of disconnected. So what we're looking for are ways to fill in some of the mid-range some of that middle register so that the melody is not just waving around in the breeze all by itself. So one of the first things we can do is let the notes ring out. If the notes are sitting in this triad, we can just hold down the, the chord shape and let the notes kind of overlap. Now a lot of the time you don't want to do that because it tends to make things feel more like just a sort of arpeggiated chord instead of a distinct melody. But if you do a few things with this, like hammer on when you can, then it starts to you know, keep that sort of linear quality as opposed to making it just sound like you're rolling through a chord. So. Now, another thing you can do is you can start off that phrase and use a double stop. Any place you can support a melody note with a note one or two strings below it, usually by the interval of a third or a sixth, will help to create a fuller sound. So we can grab index and middle and support that melody note, that opening melody note, with the note a third down, which is the root of the chord. So that helps to kind of make uh, make the melody sound a little fuller. And then when we get to the next part of the melody, we can go, you know, you can go across the guitar or you can kind of go up and down. You can think sort of vertically along the neck or you can think horizontally. So to change things up, when we get to the melody over the A chord, I'm gonna think this way. And that's gonna let me harmonize in six by using the third string underneath the melody. And in yesterday's, no, tomorrow's lesson, <laughs> shot it yesterday, but it's gonna go tomorrow. Uh, in tomorrow's lesson, I'm gonna talk about taking a Dorian scale and harmonizing it. Whoops. And get into more detail about that. But for now, we're just gonna use these shapes. So if you have the melody, Over the A for the first measure, and then over the E. And so we can harmonize that like this. We can now I'm not using an interval or of a sixth on every note, like I could do. But that can sound a little bit clunky to try to do all of that or even it's kind of cool but it, it also can make the melody stand out more by only harmonizing every other note so you really just or maybe not even every other note but just on this like on the accented notes And that way, it feels like the support is coming on in the middle. You're kind of thinking, here's the bass, here's the melody. What are my chords in the middle? It's like the way a stride pianist is thinking like, well, here's my melody, and here's my bass note, and here's my chord that lands in the middle. So you've got, you've got uh, the bass, which is standing in for sort of the whole rhythm section. But this note here is standing in for the mid-range chords, and here's your melody. So, so you grab a double stop here between the third string and the high string 
and then play the high note, and then grab another double stop along with the bass here, and then double stops here on the E minor. This is kind of outlining an E minor 7 chord. Single note, double stop, kind of outlining an E minor chord. So it gives you all of this. And then we can repeat the first phrase. And now we're into the C. If we just played the melody over the bass, we'd have that same kind of thinness problem where we've got the melody here and the bass here. So we're gonna use the index finger to grab the third string again on the strong beats. So it sounds like we're playing a lot of chords, but it's really just once on each voicing. So, so here we've got the thumb, index, and ring, then the bass, and then thumb, index, and ring, then the bass and the melody, and then maybe turn around chord, the B7 sharp nine. So that would give us for the second half of the melody, So I'll play it once without any of the inner voice stuff, and then I'll play it once with what I've just played. So we could have this. So that makes a big difference, I think. And it's really not a complicated process. We took it up an octave, we kept the bass the same, added thirds or sixths underneath the melody, either thinking going across and letting things ring out against the rest of the chord, or thinking in terms of this harmonized Dorian scale, putting notes of sixth below the melody on the third string, and then just filling in with these chords and not trying to play a harmony on every note. And that's a really big thing. Like it doesn't have to be harmonized all the way through. It just has to be harmonized enough. It's almost like, you know, impressionistic painting or something. You're gonna get all these dots put together. <laughs> Incredibly barbaric and simplified idea of what impressionism is. But you just have, you suggest things as opposed to just like spelling it out. It doesn't have to be, you know, um, like I said, like it doesn't have to be like, uh, doesn't have to be so literally harmonized, it can just suggest... Suggesting something is sometimes more musical than like really spelling it out. So, um, that's a way to just take the melody and go up the neck and create a second version. So now, there's a natural sense of development between the first version of the melody... So that's the idea just as far as creating a pair of versions of the melody. And that has a real natural development because then you can play, you know, you can play an intro to the tune, a little intro vamp. Then you can play uh, a sort of basic or fundamental pass through the melody. And then you can go and do a more embellished version of the melody. And that creates a natural sense of development or build. Because the whole idea here is how to take uh, something pretty small and compact, like an eight bar tune. And if you're not gonna do lyrics, which you know in most 
blues music is vocal and the vocal, you know, it's, it's the changing of the, the development of the verses that tells the story. So if you're going to play in an instrumental vein, then you need another way to create that sense of narrative and development. And so if you start with, uh, you know, a, a vamp or an intro that's sort of outside the main body of the tune, play through the tune once, find a way to play a different version of the melody the second time. Now you've already like created this ramp up to what might next come, uh, you know, what might come next, which is the solo. So, but instead of just like dropping right into it, you've built this, this expectation. And so then at that point, that's actually an opportunity you can drop back down. Like you might get through the melody and then do a big dynamic drop. And that gives you a chance to kind of ramp back up again, which is cool. Um, the solo does not have to come in like breathing fire. In fact, it's often really effective if everything pulls way back down. And you see all the great sort of um, modern electric blues players do this all the time. I mean, Buddy Guy and Ronnie Earl, you know, they'll do this thing where like the band just like drops to a whisper and then they have all this room to build things back up again. And so you don't have to play a lot um, and you don't have to play loud. You can just create all this room for yourself. And if you're playing solo guitar, you're the whole band, right? So there's never a danger of like getting drowned out by the drummer and having to like keep turning up, right? You just, if things are, if you need room, just tell your thumb to pipe down. You can bring it down, keep it really quiet. start bringing it up. And again, single note stuff sounds kind of empty. Now, sometimes you want that, and then you can support that with some double stops as like a call and response. So that's getting a little far afield and more into the idea of improvising and building the arrangement, but there's that. So the only other thing I wanted to talk about uh, today, because I'm trying not to go on too long, which I have a tendency to do, is the idea of uh, you can, especially like the last time through the tune, like, you know, on your way into the tune, play the tune once, repeat it, get into whatever you're gonna get into, whether that's, you know, an improvisation or something else. But on the way out, sometimes you wanna extend the ending, right? So um, there are two things that you can do, uh, specific things I'll talk about right now. One is a tag, and a tag is just going back to someplace near the ending and repeating it. So in this case, going back to the turnaround, going back to the C7 to the E minor. So um, This was your second pass through at the end, or if you went right, right into this embellished version to just play through the melody once at the end of the song. Now here's where we would tag. We would just go back to the C, to the B, to the E, and maybe one more time. And that could be it, but you could do a couple other things with the tag. One is you could, you've got this space where you're sitting on the, the E minor, so you could throw in another chord to kind of transition you back to the top of the tag. So you could go from C to B7 to E minor to A, which would take you back to the C. It would sound kind of cool. Now you're kind of adding material to the song towards the end. And it's always nice to have a couple surprises up your sleeve towards the end. Because by the time you get to the end, if someone's listening, they're like, oh yeah, I heard that, I heard that, I heard that. But oh wait, didn't hear that, cool. It's always, I think, really uh, slick to have, uh, you know, one or two more things uh, just kind of pop out towards the end that haven't happened yet. It can be really effective. And so in this case, the way I wrote out the arrangement, or the way I wrote out the, 
the tabbed out this particular version of the melody. Instead of just going to an A in open position, we could go to this inversion of A, walk up, this note's in the E chord, so we could walk up chromatically to the third of A and grab the third, the root, and the high string. So we get, and so we have, and that's sort of syncopated. So if I try to count this out, I'll probably get in trouble, but one, two, three, So we're putting the weight on the and of two, and really the definition of syncopation is just putting stress on an offbeat, like an and. So um, that gives it like that kick, you know, instead of just going, landing right on beat three. So now we can cycle around it a couple of times. From there, we want to really end the tune, maybe, so... All right, you know, it's the big finish. So, what's going on there is, once, when you're within the tune, when you're within the 8 bars or the 12 bars or whatever it is, the rules are kind of like, don't mess with the tune. Like, if you're playing the melody, you can play it. You can play um, an embroidery, like a rhythmic embroidery of the melody or sort of add fills or whatever. But you want to basically be, if you want to, you want your variations on the melody to be conscious, right? You want to, you know, you want to, um, you want to work from a position of knowing what the melody is. And then if you want to mess up the melody, that's cool. But you want to do it on purpose, not just because you didn't remember quite how it went. Although sometimes that works out okay too. Um, there's a great Art Pepper story about that, which I'll relate if, at the end if I, if there's time and I remember. But um, same thing goes for the chord progression. Like if you're going to put in chord substitutions and change around what's going on with the chords, do it consciously, knowing kind of this is what the tune is supposed to have. And now I'm going to make this choice from a position of knowledge as opposed to just like because you didn't bother to figure out what the chords were supposed to be. Now that's my take anyway. Uh, but <clears throat> when you're doing anything that gets outside the boundaries of the official tune, like an intro, or if you stop and drop into a vamp in the middle of the tune, or if you're doing a tag, anytime you're adding material to the boundaries of the tune, like you're going beyond the original shape of the tune, you have a lot more latitude. And so in this case, this addition to the tag, If we break it down, it's just a bunch of blues licks. Right, so it starts with the melody. And then just goes down a pentatonic scale. Right, plain as dirt. And then goes sort of back up a little bit. With a blues lick there. So it basically goes down the scale and then comes back up. Really simple. And then underneath it, here's the chords of the tag. But now I'm going to an A chord. And this is really just an E minor chord with a third in the bass. This is an F sharp chord, which is the two. So that's setting up the five chord. So that's a two five. If you're not too scared of that, <laughs> I know I always get scared of them, two fives. It's like, oh no, it's getting deep and jazzy. But like, here's the two, and there's the five, and there's the one. So it's not a really complicated chord progression. It's from the, from the song, flat six, to five, to four, to one, to two, to five, to one. And then it's just putting that together over the syncopation. And if you look at the bass, So that's just doing a really, once the sort of syncopated rhythm is set up in the bass, it just keeps going. So one, two, three, four, 
and one and two and three and four and one and two and three and four and. So it's basically always like and two and four and two and four. And if you've been doing just steady bass the whole way through, then going to that kind of syncopated rhythm in the bass at the end is very different from anything that's happened so far. And so that's one of those surprises you might want to keep up your sleeve till the very end. So if we play through the whole ending, the whole embellished version with this ending, we get this. Okay, so that's the idea. Um, a basic melody, take it up an octave, find ways to support it with intervals and chords, um, use an inner voice on the second or third string. Um, and then when you get to the end, you can tag the ending, uh, you can substitute the chords a little bit, you can add material in the form of blues licks on top, and you can support that with chord substitutions underneath, and you can finally you know, with all of that, you can syncopate what you've got at the end to really add just one more level of kind of coordinated surprise towards the end. So that's the embellished version. Again, both the fundamental and the embellished version are in the PDF handout that's on the page with all of this week's lessons. And I'll post the link again, because just in case there's any trouble with this link, but if you basically go to fretboardconfidential.com forward slash embellished forward slash improvisation, or slash groove, you can find all that stuff. So um, that's kind of what I came to talk about, but since we're live, I see there's some comments going on, so I will just sort of awkwardly lean over and look at my computer and see what's going on. And if there are questions, I will attempt to answer them for a little bit. Let's see. Um, da -da 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 -da. So yeah, the URL sucks, good to know. Um, no real questions. Um, all right. Well, um, if you've got questions, feel free to put them in. And meanwhile, I'll just uh, <clears throat> I'll just vamp here for a second uh, and mention a couple of other things. Um, basically, uh, <clears throat> that. Just to reiterate, this is part of a series of lessons. And it's really just the, the point here is to take um, some of the more elusive aspects of playing fingerstyle guitar, uh, fingerstyle blues in particular, and try to create some specific uh, mechanics for it. Um, so, you know, things like improvisation, which can feel really vague, things like groove, which can feel like really hard to put your finger on like what makes a good groove and things like you know how do you come up with a full arrangement these are the three main topics that i'm covering this week in these in-depth lessons that are posted so um this is really more just like a, an additional thing where it's like oh yeah it's good to know a couple versions of the tune and it always comes up like how do you play up the neck and how do you how do you find and create those what goes into making a more elaborate version of the tune or an embellished version of the tune um <clears throat> oh the Art Pepper story, yes. Uh, and then from, oh, hey, Bill Z. Please, again, slowly with the A to E minor to F turnaround. The A to E minor to F. Oh, uh, okay. Um, so yes, the turn here's the turnaround again, and then I'll do the Art Pepper story. So... <laughs> uh, let's see, the bass comes on the and, too, so... There's 
two things I really believe in. One, drummers should be able to play quietly and still sound good. And so should guitar players for that matter. And the other thing is teachers should be able to play stuff slowly if they possibly can. Um, and I know it's, I know both those things are hard, but um, it's a point of pride to be able to slow these things down. Okay, uh, the, oh, question about my callings and question about from Don, hey Donald, uh, elaborate on harmonizing with thirds and sixths. Okay, that is actually, I go into that in a great deal of detail tomorrow. So two birds with one stone. I will be talking about that in tomorrow's lesson. If you go grab the PDF now, you can actually get a preview of what the, you can see the tab for tomorrow's lesson, it's in there. Um, and to answer the other question, which I've lost track of, but will tomorrow be live? No, tomorrow will already, will be recorded again. Um, I tried to get as many of these done uh, ahead of time as possible, but it's also fun to do it live and take some questions, so here we are. Um, so the Art Pepper story I just was reading recently. Um, <clears throat> So Art Pepper, alto saxophonist, and also by his own description, uh, seriously problematic drug addict. And he hadn't played or recorded in six months. And his wife and his producer, record producer, conspired to set up a recording session so he would have to play. And so he is in bed one morning, like feeling terrible as usual. and. Someone comes to the door and is like, well, we got this recording session. And he's like, what? And not only that, but when he gets to the studio, he's not just recording with anybody. He's recording with Miles Davis's rhythm section. This is like 1958. So he's got like Red Chamber, <laughs> Red Garland, Paul Chambers, and I think Philly Joe Jones are in the studio, like waiting to play with Art Pepper. These are like the three most famous guys in jazz besides Miles Davis at the moment, basically. They're like the rhythm section. And so... He hasn't played his horn in six months. And now he's got to play with the world's greatest rhythm section. And so uh, one of the guys, Red Garland or somebody, says, hey, what about this tune? Because like he hasn't prepared any tunes. He doesn't know. They're just going to play some standards. And so he's like, yeah, I think I know that tune. And he said that in late this interview, you know, he's recounting this years later. And he says, when the record came out, there was this really glowing review of what a beautiful job Art Pepper did reimagining the melody to such and such a tune. And Art Pepper's like, I wasn't reimagining anything. I was just trying desperately to remember as much of the melody as I could. And that was as close as I could get. <laughs> so it's not that funny a story because if he hadn't been so strung out, it wouldn't have been such a bad situation. But still, the idea that like, you know, you can come up with this beautiful variation on the melody out of ignorance is kind of fantastic. However, I'm also saying like, you know, if you can do your part, learn the melody before you start to mess around with it. Um, so there's that. Um, <clears throat> there's also that uh, jazz aesthetic of knowing the words to the melodies. And if you're not familiar with the jazz robots videos on YouTube, if you can go find the one where they're talking about playing ballads and knowing the melody, it's pretty hilarious. Okay, um, do you, would you put Benz into this song? Okay, here's my thing. Um, I don't really bend a whole bunch on the acoustic guitar. Uh, I feel like it's not really set up for it. It's not really idiomatically called for. Um, and the closest I would get to it is like quarter tone bends. This tune you're in E minor so that's maybe going to be a little bit out of the box however I don't mean to be a total party pooper about it. if you can find a way to do it and it sounds cool then go for it maybe half step bends I am I did listen to a lot of John Renborn and Stefan Grossman when I was learning to play and I'm pretty sure it's Renborn who's doing all the half step bending like that on those duet records they made like Stefan Grossman and John Renborn and Under the Volcano so those things are kind of cool. But as a general rule, I tend to replace bending when I'm playing acoustic guitar with slides. So, so instead of, because partly, I don't know, it just sounds kind of out of place to me. But that's totally my personal choice. I'm not poo-pooing it. If you like to bend, then work them in and more power to you. But I kind of like that sound better. And when you listen to, you know, um, if you listen to electric blues players uh, sort of before a certain era, 
you'll hear a lot more. Um, I mean, B.B. King, notwithstanding, who kind of is the fountainhead for that stuff, B.B. and Albert King for all that bending. But, you know, the guitar players who come more out of an acoustic tradition or who maybe learned on acoustic before acquiring electric guitars, um, you know, Guitar Slim, um, and then later examples like Jimmy Vaughn, you hear these guys play in open position and they're not bending. They're doing that kind of... That kind of thing on electric guitar because it's more tied to the acoustic vibe, and also sometimes those people are playing with like heavier strings for the tone and whatnot. So um, that's just my thought on the process. But again, like if you can find ways to do it, do it. Um, more questions. Let's see. Um, an African drum teacher said, every mistake is a new style. Yeah, I've heard that quote before, too. I actually went to school with a couple of African, where there was a big African drumming program, and I was too clueless to participate. But I did see a lot of live African music and a lot of live high life music. So um, it all went blowing right by me because I was obsessed with, like, you know, American music from 1940 and wasn't aware of what was sitting right in front of me. But that's another story for another time. Uh, could I cover A Fool for a Cigarette in one of my streams one day, please? Oh, that's funny. I actually played an excerpt from that tune yesterday when I was on Jeff Plankenhorn's show because someone was asking about what's your favorite tuning. And I was like, well, my favorite tuning is C, but I like playing in D. And then I, one of the things, the first thing I could remember that came to mind was, was uh, the Roy Bookbinder arrangement of Fool for a Cigarette. Um, I don't always play... Uh, Sometimes there, there's tunes I can play and tunes that I can't play uh, as far as um, what I can put on the internet because uh, I can only, for the most part, use public domain material. So, you know, if I go and I chase down the copyright info and uh, it's clear enough that it's one person's composition or one person's copyright, then it doesn't make it into the channel and it doesn't make it into my lessons. So that's kind of the rule of thumb. I'm actually working on that. I know I've been saying this for like a year to anybody who will listen, but I mean, I've, you know, working on, uh, it's very Byzantine, the, all the different pieces you have to put together to get the rights to use copywritten material. So uh, <clears throat> it's not worth uh, freestyling it and getting stuff taken down, but uh, uh, sort of have this very glacial machinery in place to kind of get that worked out more. Um, but as long as I'm here, uh, let me grab the national. And I can show you a little bit of it. So I'm in detuning. Almost. So the rough outline, Fool for a Cigarette, is it's the arrangement I know, is with an alternating thumb, and with open D, you've got those notes, and then the melody's just coming down. A mixolydian scale, for lack of a better term. There's a quarter tone bend for you. chord is this shape. In an open D, it, it looks just like an E7 chord. Those two notes, second fret on the fifth string, first fret on the third string. But it sounds like a four chord, and in this case a G chord, with the third and the bass. And so you're going to alternate between the fifth string and the fourth string. And now you're playing licks. I talked at the beginning of the lesson about going across versus going horizontally. So here, thinking horizontally, and here we're thinking vertically. And the five chord is this, which looks almost like an E7 again. Here's your root and your fifth and your flat seven. And then 
playing some octaves. So that's kind of how it's built. Those are the pieces. We're gonna stash this here. So, full for a cigarette, the rough version. Um, hmm, more questions. Uh, I'm doing mainly instrumentals, says Pierre Alex. But how would you add a singing part to this piece? How would you comp yourself? That is a good question with a tremendously large answer. So I don't know if I'll be able to get into that too much. But let me give you just a short version. <laughs> So, um, you know, here's, here's what we've got for the melody. Now, that's got to go away if you're going to sing. And if we just take that away right now, all we have is the bass. So I guess I would think about, you know, what would I want for an accompaniment? Um, and would I want chords? What kind of register would I want to be in? And would I want to do any kind of calm response with myself? This melody is pretty busy. Like there's not a lot of room. You can see. One, two. There's not a lot of space for fills. Unlike an eight, a 12 bar blues where there's like a couple bars at the end of every line. So let me think about this. This is a terrible key for me too. I wonder if I have a capo line around. Right, here it is. Let's see. See if I can find. The first thing I'll do is try to find a key that I could sing it in. Sometimes I'm... that's all right. I mean, honestly, like, like I don't want to get the capo above the fifth fret because then the guitar just sounds too sparkly, right? It starts to sound like "Here Comes the Sun," which is great for "Here Comes the Sun," but not so much for like the way I want to accompany myself on a song like this. If I go back down, that's definitely too high for me, right? So I'm fishing around. This is not ideal. What I would do at this point is I'd be like, oh, well, can I put this in like A minor shapes so that I can get it up in a register where I want, like sometimes I feel, now that's perfect, right? And now I could use my embellished version of the melody right here because it's the same shapes, right? Here's my, here's the same shape that I had up here. So. to reharmonize it because I want to go to a yeah so I'd do that I do a minor and then I'd go to F to D over F sharp and really this F is kind of standing in for a D minor right it's like here's D minor so I'm just taking this note here this F and I'm putting it in the bass playing first inversion right there's the third of the D minor I want to get that lift, so I'm going to like a major four chord, which now is a D with an F sharp in the bass. So I'm just working out the the situation, the melody and the chords before I even worry about singing. There's my funky flat six chord. This was what was the C7 shape, but now I'm using F7 because I'm in the key of A. A, G, F, that's my flat six. Here's my five. Four. Cool, so now I, I've got to pass through the tune. And so now I can think about, hmm. I'm thinking, how can I get the bass to go steady? And what can I do? You know what, I've got my vamp now, there's my little intro, and I'm literally just going to start singing and see what my hands do, and see how they can stay out of the way but still contribute something. And I never sing this song, so I'm not sure how great this is going to go. Uh, so I'm... Sometimes I feel like a motherless child. Sometimes I feel like a motherless child. Sometimes 
times I know, oh I know, times I feel like a motherless child, a long way from home. So that's what I want. I want that. That's what I want as my accompaniment. So sometimes I feel, sometimes I feel like a motherless child. Sometimes I feel, so I'm just really getting downbeats. Sometimes I feel like a motherless child. Sometimes I feel, so, and maybe a little bit of syncopation like. got a little room for a fill, so I'm going to play the bass there. So it's that syncopation thing. Bass is keeping the groove. It's keep, bass is keeping the pulse. One and two and three and four and one and two and three. And that'll actually sit behind the vocal pretty well, I think, if I'm not too loud. So sometimes I feel like a motherless child. Sometimes I feel like a motherless child Sometimes I feel like a motherless child A long way from home And now if I'm in this register I might not want to go up an octave, so, right, that's going to be super tweedly. But if I just stick to the, the steady bass for the first melody, now I could start to do some shifting chords underneath. So that's what I want. I want to hear this. And then kind of get the melody over it. So. That's going to take a little time to work out. But that's what I would want. And so then I could have, I could also have that behind the, that might be cool to have behind the vocal too. So sometimes I feel like a motherless child. have all this kind of like stuff behind the vocal so there's a lot of things you could do I don't know if that answers your question um, but uh, yes I did previously do a video on accompaniment but that was that was in the membership that was not just sort of in general out here on YouTube so that's a bit that's um, yeah uh, let's see um, Oh, what gauge strings do I use on the Martin? And oh, so Pierre Alex, I hope that answered your question. Um, strings on the Martin. Um, I'm using old ones. Uh, yeah, they are John Pierce phosphor bronze with a 12 on top and a 56 on the bottom, I think. Whatever the medium, no, whatever the light gauge, light for acoustic guitar is a 12 on top. So 0 0.012 on top. And then it goes down. Now this is a 0018 and it's um, got a short scale. So 24 and 7 eighths or whatever it is as opposed to 25 and something. Um, so the short scale, the shorter distance between the bridge and the nut than say a dreadnought, to me gives it a, a, a more playable feel. It's not as stiff. Uh, and so between that and the gauge of the strings, um, you know, it feels uh, feels good to me. Uh, I like to have a certain amount of flexibility. I don't like to be too hard to play. 
I haven't played a dreadnought in a bazillion years. They're just not just not comfortable to me. Um, and someone was asking earlier about the callings that I play, and that is also a short scale guitar. It's a it's also a double O style. It's modeled on I think a 1920. This is a 56. The callings I think is modeled on a 1929 Martin design, and it's 12th fret, so it joins the body at the 12th fret. I almost brought it over today, and then I spaced. Um, but it's also got a short scale. Um, <clears throat> I just played, just went out to Collings and played through a bunch of the Waterloo guitars. And that was super fun. Um, and those are various. Like, And some of them felt stiffer, and some of them felt more flexible. Um, they're all based on older models from the 30s. Some of them have ladder bracing. Some of them have X bracing, which I don't really know much of about the difference between, I mean, I understand that they're shaped like this or they're shaped like that. But as far as what they do and how they sound, it was the first time I ever really sat down and AB'd ladder bracing and X bracing and, you know, this kind of model and that kind of model and all that sort of thing. So that was a lot of fun. And so uh, though that kind of shorter scale guitar, some of those Waterloo's are shorter scale and that really appeals to me as well. So when people are asking like, what kind of guitar for fingerstyle, I often say, well, you know, if you can find a short scale guitar. Um, Martin has reissued, they've done like various versions of the double O in the last 10 or 20 years as well. And everybody makes like small body guitars now. Um, so I always recommend that because I find them more comfortable myself, but you just have to sort of pick them up and play them and see what the neck feels like and what the string resistance feels like. And you know, it has to get set up. Um, you know, I always like the guitar. I don't like that paper thin action thing because um, I play kind of hard, like I snap and I pick kind of hard. And so everything will sound snappy and buzzy in my hands if I don't have a certain amount of action to work with. And plus sometimes, I don't play that much slide right now, but at one point I wanted my guitars to be able to, I wanted to be able to play slide or a regular guitar on them. And so I made sure that the action could kind of withstand that. Um, more than anybody needs to know about me and my guitars. Oh, thank you, Top Cat. The top is a 50, 53, oh, okay. All right, I didn't know that. I get confused because um, for a long time I would change the strings more often on my lap style Dobro and my Regal than anything else. And those have like super heavy strings. So remembering what's what is tricky. Uh, here's a comment from Roger. Uh, if there, oh, Jafal, okay. So from John, I would love a lesson on Miss Henderson's Riding Academy, either on the stream or on True Fire. I would gladly pay for it. Um, that's an interesting question. And if there had been an admission for that, I'm not sure what you're talking about, Roger, what I just did maybe. Uh, okay, um, cool, I'm glad that that was. So there's some guys chiming in here that are here from, that uh, are in the Fingerstyle Five, which is my monthly membership. And I'll be talking about that more later, but not right now. Um, yeah, oh, Miss Henderson's Writing Academy. So that's one of my songs. I always feel a little weird explaining my own songs. I'm like, who wants to know that? But, uh, I'll give you the short version. What time is it? Yeah, we got a few minutes. Um, uh, so this is a song from my record, Pennsylvania Station Blues, and it uses basically E shapes, but capo to the third fret. Again, it's a vocal thing. And it's alternating thumb. And the main thing that makes it go is that you only really, you know, instead of holding out a whole E chord, I'm just using my index finger to get the bass, which is going root, root, five, flat seven, and hammer on. And then what's going on with the fingers is what's making it sound so syncopated. And so I'm not sure, I've never had to teach this, so I'm not sure exactly what's going on. I haven't had to break it down, which is novel. Um, let's see. Well, okay, I would say that this kind of refers back to something I talked about a lot in uh, a six-part series I did on the channel called uh, six, Step to Playing, six Steps to Playing Fingerstyle Blues, which you can find on here, um, and it's free, and there's a download for it and everything with the tab. But it's this idea that thumb and fingers, like this alone is not gonna sound funky. It's, it's that thumb index thing with some damp notes on top. So you can just make sure you're playing the bottom three strings relatively cleanly and then 
drape your fingers across the top three strings just to get this sound down, which is to go. So you're pushing down when you need the bass note, you're pushing down with your left hand when you need the note. But otherwise, it's just a bunch of this. So it's mostly just this. And then sometimes grabbing those open strings on top. And there's all these kinds of things you can do with that. But that is just part of realizing that there's more to the alternating thumb than just Right? which is cool and appropriate for some things, but if you really want that sort of funky snap, you have to get a lot more control over all of this stuff. And so that tune basically starts out that way. And then you can start to put stuff over it. say the rest is commentary but it comes from that that right hand left hand coordination to make everything sort of muted and funky so I hope that at least gives a little bit of insight into that um <clears throat> uh Don Myers yes I am playing a double O it's a double O 18 so um yes top cat the dreadnought the right hand position that's the problem yeah reaching around all that dreadnought it's it's kind of a bummer for me too um uh, oh, uh, from Lee Lewis, I'd like to see you cover some Rye Cooter acoustic tunes. Okay, um, well, so uh, again, this gets into like the copyright snag, but I did do a version, I did teach um, the break to um, uh, Tampum Up Solid on, on a YouTube lesson, right? So you can go look for that. You know, that's just a... Also, I may have done Crow Jane, uh, not Crow Jane, Crow Black Chicken. Uh, uh, not in the tuning that Rai Cooter uses, I just did it in drop D. I think that so I know there's I know there's some I don't know if it's the complete arrangement but I know that there's some tab for crow black chicken on my downloads page so just fretboardconfidential.com forward slash downloads there's like, like 50 tabs like sitting around there and so a lot of the blues stuff that I've been doing lately um, and a lot of past lessons you can find tab right there so I know that I know that tampum up solid and crow black chicken are on there I'm at least that organized to know that um, yeah, I love Ry Cooter's acoustic playing. And it was one of those things, like his slide playing, that I just thought was impossible uh, until I had to kind of sit down and figure it out. And then it was like, okay, it's not impossible. It's just really, um, it's, a, it's a very distinctive thing. It's its own thing. Nobody plays slide like Ry Cooter does, and nobody really finger picks like him. I think on a subliminal level, a lot of the syncopated things that I love to do come from just like listening to the, you know, that handful of records over and over again, like Into the Purple Valley and uh, um, uh, Paradise and Lunch, um, 
boomer story, all that early stuff. Um, oh, and there's also a lesson. I did a lesson on just on the whole Rykuter rhythm thing, right? So just how he uses using G tuning to play in D. I think the lesson has some lame clickbait name like the Rykuter rhythm trick. But uh, uh, if you go find that, that I, I teach some Rykuter stuff in that lesson too. Um, mostly that whole. that stuff that you know then turned into like depending on whose version of it you believe that either Rye Cooter showed to the Rolling Stones or the Keith Richards shamelessly ripped off from Rye Cooter but anyway I already got into that controversy once on YouTube and I won't make that mistake again unless I already have oh uh, let's see a few more questions um, uh, so we talked about that um, do I ever do songwriting workshops well that's a good question <clears throat> I was just talking with my buddy uh, Jeff Plankenhorn yesterday online, and he was talking about songwriting workshops he was doing with our mutual friend Scrappy Dead Newcomb here in Austin. And I was thinking, like, that's funny. Like, I've never taught songwriting, really. Um, I think it'd be fun. I just don't know if anybody would show up. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I've thought about doing it um, and uh, just haven't, haven't. But uh, one of my favorite subjects, one of my favorite things to do, and I certainly have a lot of thoughts about what it is and how to do it and what kind of models I learned from and what you can get from that. So that is something I could certainly look into. Um, okay. Uh, from Bill again, thanks for the insight of slightly higher action. Yeah. For slide and finger style. Definitely. Um, yes. Oh, good. You've done it too. Perfect. Um, let's see. Anything else? Thank you. Oh, in Amarillo. Nice. Just up the street from me. And you remember. Great. Well, thanks, John. Um, okay, well, as usual, I've gone on and on longer than I planned to. But it's fun to talk about these things and just think about um, all, the, all the details of playing guitar. Um, okay, so I guess I'll wrap it up there. Um, so that's the idea for creating an embellished arrangement. Uh, remember that? That's what we came here to do. <laughs> um, tomorrow, I'll be posting the third lesson, third official lesson. I guess this is one of the lessons in the series too. But I'll be posting the arranging lesson tomorrow and talking about uh, something called the seven-step arc, which is a way to build an arrangement out of things like vamps, and the shout chorus, and the fundamental and embellished version of a tune, and an intro, and all that kind of stuff. So um, if you're interested, just go to the links I've been talking about, and I'll post the links. And you can go now and watch the first two lessons. You can go and download the PDF for all the content for this week. And um, you can come and check it out tomorrow uh, on the site. And um, if you got other questions or other things you'd like to see addressed, leave them in the comments below, or especially um, leave them in the comments over on the website because I didn't have the comments set up until yesterday. And so uh, if you've got questions or comments, that's a good place to leave them. Um, so let's see what we got here. Oh, one more thing from Joel. Fingerstyle workshop in Austin with barbecue and the pandemic is all done. Yeah, of course, yes. Um, a couple years ago, I hatched this grand scheme with John Knowles to run a workshop in Austin because he's got family here, and we had, we had, uh, we, you know, we had the swag all designed practically in our heads, you know, the mugs and the T-shirts with our logo, and and then you know, just I even I actually literally found a place to put the workshop on, and then we never quite pulled the trigger on it. But maybe when the pandemic's over, yes, we'll do uh, we'll do barbecue and finger stomp blues in Austin. All right, everybody, thanks for being here. I'll play a little bit on the way out. Uh, Glad you could all show up, uh, and um, maybe I'll uh, maybe I'll see you tomorrow.
All right. Thanks for being everybody, here, everybody. Come and check out the arranging lesson tomorrow.